<laughs> Thank you very much, Malay. I think I enjoyed the talk by Altamash, and it kind of set the tone for my talk. And I think we all realize how difficult it is to manage weight. We swing from weight loss to weight regain, and then we come back again to weight loss, and the cycle just keeps continuing. And weight is a very dynamic, you know, sort of uh, parameter. We don't know what the optimum weight should be, but obviously whatever our current weight is, we obviously benefit by a weight reduction. The question keeps coming in is, how can we sustain the weight where you know we are and where we take it to? Obviously, we don't want to take it up. We want to take it down, and that's where the challenge lies. So I'm going to take a step further from what uh, Altamaj just talked about, the physiological patterns of energy and how the body tends to regulate that. And we're going to modulate that with pharmacological and lifestyle interventions to see how best we can make this possible. These are the disclosures. But this is how I'm going to discuss my talk today. And we're going to talk about what are the options available for obesity management, the guidelines to integrate available treatment options, and transition from guidelines to clinical practice. Remember that we may have all the guidelines, all the knowledge. It's just a question of how can you discipline your mind and make whatever you learn you know, work. And unless you make that possible, we'll just be sort of having a lot of theory, but yet you know, we may not achieve the results that we're really looking for. And you have to always make small changes first to make an impact on the larger canvas. We don't sort of give them large goals to our patient and say you need to reduce you know, 30 kilos of weight or 40 kilos of weight. That seems very unrealistic at all. So if you can encourage them to make small changes and you know, make that happen, that gives them a kind of a boost to see that they can do it. The key factor is in all our practices, we need to have conversations related to obesity happening. When you see a patient with you know, overweight or obesity, we don't really bring up conversations related to weight with them, and we tend to neglect that. And we all know today that obesity is the mother of all non-communicable diseases, wherever you look at it. And if you look at this time's ADA, majority of the lectures were focused on obesity management. And we have now more and more pharmacotherapy that is coming in for obesity management. And we are seeing new innovations that are happening in obesity area rather than diabetes area. And we know that if you can target obesity more effectively, then you're going to get better you know, downs downside, better control of your blood pressures, your sugars, and everything that you look at, lipids and everything. So there is now a shifting focus towards obesity management. And the physiology which Altamas just spoke about is how can you modulate that physiology to see that, you know, can you intervene with lifestyle and pharmacotherapies. So today, what is the options that are available for us? And this, I think, remains a key slide through my talk, that you always begin with healthy eating habits, physical activity, and behavioral therapy. And Altima just spoke very well how simple activities can build up energy consumption. And if you can encourage people to do simple activities, it will definitely go a long way to keep them active. Very often we find that people just don't move and they tend to then develop a lot of musculoskeletal problems and that makes it even harder because the obesity just contributes more and more to musculoskeletal problems and that sort of the vicious cycle continues of weight regains happening. Now, if you, you're not really successful when it comes to lifestyle interventions, then you obviously at some point of time want to see can we intervene with pharmacotherapy. And Ultimately, of course, for those patients who really have a major problem with comorbidities, then perhaps surgery may be the only solution for these people. And we are now, of course, understanding more and more the role of surgery. But uh, let me sort of uh, flip that around and say now we're getting better agents in terms of you know, weight control with the newer molecules that are coming in, which promises almost to the tune of 20% or 23% of weight loss. We don't know whether surgery may be the best option for morbid obesity in future. And we may have better agents to control our weight problems. So let me just sort of, you know, dwell a little bit on the lifestyle approach because I think that remains the cornerstone. One is, of course, as uh, the energy pyramid, uh, energy cycle that uh, Altamash spoke about, the en energy intake and expenditure. So obviously, reduced caloric intake is a very important part of it. And you need to make this very individualistic. You cannot sort of 
have one size fit all for everybody and say that this is going to be a meal pattern and i hate it when the nutritionist will just come out with charts and say this is what you need to follow because every patient or every individual likes has his own taste and you want to see that if you go across india even our cultural tastes are so different that you know if you go from north to south and south east to west our patterns of eating tend to change so you can't have a sort of a meal pattern that is going to be universal all across the country even the consumption or the composition of proteins carbs and fats in every individual meal uh, for the same sort of a dish uh, cooked by different people may be different so you need to be very individualistic in your approach when it comes to caloric uh, restriction so energy restriction remains a key intermittent fasting has been one of the ways that you can do a time restricted feeding and this is important because uh, we have seen benefits out of you know time restricted feeding and intermittent fasting but again it comes down to the fact that how long can you sustain it most of these therapies tend to fail after a period of time because the whole own human nature of eating in india eating is a religion and you know unless we give a good food all across come to meetings come to religious functions and a success is gauged by the fact that what is the food that is laid out out there and unless you really control that part of it you're never going to be successful in terms of weight management so you have to learn to say no and unless you learn to say no you're not going to be very successful out there right the second part is of course you need to encourage them to do a mix of exercises and i sort of disagree with people who say i walk 10 kilometers a day i think walking is the worst exercise if you're doing only 10 kilometers a day walking you have to do a mix of resistance training and endurance training and if a good exercise physiologist will tell you that you need to balance out an endurance training with resistance exercises if you need to get more energy consumption out of an individual so anybody who tells you that i walk 10 kilometers a day is not going to be a very successful in terms of their weight management you have to encourage them to do a lot of resistance training which is going to be very useful from their point of view and then of course you need to set your own goals what you're looking at as i said that if you're going to keep large goals for individuals it's going to be a failure right from the beginning keep them on smaller goals and that's why if you look at all the algorithms that we had earlier we would talk about you know we would say absolute numbers of how much weight loss you need to effect and that was never a beginner now we talk about as you know altima showed in his slides 5% weight loss 10% weight loss or 15% weight loss the gains that you get out of it and if you tell somebody just do 5% weight loss in next 3 months it's more achievable by that individual and he says yes i can do it perhaps and then you say okay you've achieved your 5% you do another 5% so ineffectively he's done 10% accumulated put together and that is getting the benefit it may be spanned out over a period of time but you need to do goal setting for individuals and you have to see how you can make it possible and encourage them to achieve those goal settings and then of course mental distractions are very important like i said as you was just pointing out all the possible things how you know uh, mental attractions to food are there the similar you have to have mental distractions from food and if you can do mental distractions from food i think that's going to be a big big achievement i was just reading a sort of you know paper while well, on my flight coming which just figured in nature uh, i think this month or last month and i was reading that paper and what they looked at was morning calorie loading versus evening calorie loading and some of the earlier studies did show that if you have an evening calorie loading then you tend to have a weight loss happening and if you do a morning calorie loading then you don't get a weight i mean you get a weight gain app. sorry evening calorie loading you get a weight gain and if you have a lower evening evening calorie loading then you tend to achieve a weight loss and this is how the circadian rhythm sort of behaves now this paper is very interesting they said that they looked at people who did a mon morning calorie loading versus evening calorie loading and they found there was really no change in the weight but what it did tell us was if you do a morning calorie loading then there is a suppression of appetite that tends to happen and sustenance of weight is much easier if you have a morning calorie loading versus an evening calorie loading so that's you know something which is possible that you can tell people so people who have large breakfast tend to have a lesser appetite during the day and tend to eat less as compared to people who tend to eat more during so the key thing is all of us if you look at it all of us tend to overeat at 5 pm and that 5 pm is a sort of a killer time when we tend to eat everything inside because it's more like a fatigue beating a fatigue by eating more 
or when you go back home after a day's work, you just grab everything inside because you're just hungry. And you may have done huge amount of calorie restriction during the day, but you bake off at 5 o'clock and say, I'm going to eat everything inside. So that 5 p.m. is a very key factor, and that's been shown in various studies, that if you can sort of be that 5 p.m. fatigue, so that's why people come out with all kind of, you know, zero calorie foods where you can say, okay, can I get a satiety at 5 p.m.? And that will help me to beat that part of it and maybe the calorie restrictions can continue. So these are all important in their own way that how you do your meal uh, planning and how it works. Now at some point of time, all this is good, but it doesn't help. And you want to see that what is the next step forwards when it comes to you know changing your weight. And today, earlier we had very limited options when it comes to pharmacotherapy, but today we have got a number of them available. So when would you really require to start pharmacotherapy for obesity management? So when you have attempted good, decent lifestyle changes, but you could not achieve it, the goal. Or you're regaining the weight after losing it, and you want to break that cycle by saying, can I intervene and prevent the weight regain from happening? So something that becomes a habit will sustain then. And the last thing is, of course, people who have got a BMI between 27 to 29.9 with a weight-related complication, any of the comorbidities like sleep apnea, hypertension, or with a BMI of more than or equal to 30, these would be candidates where pharmacotherapy intervention would be beneficial. Now, these are the plethora of agents that we have today. Some of them we don't have in our country, but uh, they're available. Orlistat, naltrexone with bupropion, liraglutide 3 milligram, Fentiramine with topiramate and semaglutide 2.4. So other than Orlistat, we don't have most of the other agents available with us as combinations for weight management. But just in a nutshell, if you look at the mechanism of action of Orlistat, it's energy wastage. Naltrexone, bipropion, it's appetite. And all the other four actually are appetite suppressants. And semaglutide 2.4 is appetite regulation. And what is the weight loss that you achieve? If you look at from early stat, from baseline one year, intervention caused about 10.6 kilograms compared against placebo. Uh, naltrexone, bipropion, baseline two week to 56. The intervention arm had 5.4 to 8.1 percent versus placebo 1.3 to 4.9 percent, depending on the dosage. And liraglutide three milligram from baseline to 56 caused 8 percent versus 2.6 percent with placebo. And fentiramine topiramate caused 5.1, 10.9 uh, versus 1.6. That's again dose related. And semaglutide 2.4, 14.9. So 15% was what 2.4. And if you look at the terzepatide, it causes almost about 20, 17 to 20%. And we are now initiating trials now with cargolinotide with semaglutide. And that we anticipate is going to be. 20 to 23% of weight loss that will happen. And we are just uh, one of our centers, our center is the one which has been chosen to, for the trial for Kargi Sema. So we are looking at how these pharmacotherapeutic interventions are going to be helping us in terms of weight reduction. And if it successfully works, and the main thing is patient tolerance to these agents. And that's the key limiting factor, that if they can tolerate, and if you look at the last line of adverse events, you'll see all across the board, all these agents have a predominantly GI intolerance. And you know, if you can sustain that GI intolerance for a while and patients able to continue, then of course, it has a lot of success in terms of weight management. I'm not going to, because of want of time, get into this, but these are the various sites where all these agents tend to work. Now, when would you really offer surgery? And this is an option for selected patients. So it would be an option if the BMI is between 30 to 39.9 with an obesity-related comorbidity, or if the BMI is more than or equal to 40 kilogram per square meter, or gastric, uh, when there is a sort of complication to reoperations. Or gastric bypass is associated with a 30 to 50 percent lower risk of death in patients 7 to 15 years after surgery versus those who don't. So the bottom line is patients with morbid obesity, you, if nothing else works, then your option is only surgery and you don't have any other choices. But remember that all patients with uh, you know, any form of metabolic surgery, it's not that the lifestyle intervention should not be continued. It still remains a cornerstone. And the discussion that favored around was that 
when you look at patients with post-bariatric surgery, even in those patients, weight regain remain a problem. And you find that after a while, even post-bariatric surgery, people tend to get a weight regain. So the argument was that if you have given a metabolic surgery to a patient, then why can't we maintain them on pharmacotherapy to sustain the benefit of the metabolic surgery? And we now are looking at trials which look at that patients who are left alone after metabolic surgery with lifestyle versus metabolic surgery, lifestyle, and a pharmacotherapy. And you find that there is a better sustenance of the weight after you have a maintenance of a pharmacotherapy added on to the regime. It's like similar if you have a cancer therapy, you put them on a maintenance therapy after your initial cycles of chemotherapy, and you find that the benefit in terms of you know, recurrence rates tend to go down. So similarly, weight regain rates would probably be benefited if you can follow up a post-bariatric surgery with a pharmacotherapy. Now, what are the guidelines to integrate? I hope I have some time, yeah, okay, to integrate available treatment options. And we can see here that the patients with obesity can be very diverse in terms of their age, race, sex, ethnicity, genetics, complications, and so on and so forth. And there is a lot of heterogeneity of treatment effects. So there will be a great variation in weight loss responses. So each individual tend to respond variably. They may have a uh, susceptible to adverse effects of treatment. So one patient may uh, tolerate a particular therapy very easily, and another person may not be able to do that. So there's a difference in terms of the effects of the same treatment that you give to two different individuals. And of course, some treatments may have weight loss independent health benefits. That thus some patients may achieve additional health benefits. So obviously, it means that treatments have to be individual. And you need to have teams which can monitor. It's just no point in giving a particular therapy unmonitored. It's as good as not giving it. And you may probably not get the benefit. And it will probably set back the patient in thinking that nothing is achievable. It may have a negative impact value. So you need to have trained teams which can counsel, look at their nutrition. You need to have a psychologist on board, an exercise physiologist, and somebody who can do a follow-up with the patient in terms of seeing where the patient is heading. Now, this is just a very, very crude algorithm where we look at the staging through BMI and anthropometric measures, and then you've got three tier you know, treatment pathways in terms of diet, exercise, pharmacotherapy, and surgery. And these are the various guidelines. And the earlier guidelines were more BMI-centric, but now we tend to think that they should be more complication-centric. And look at the number of guidelines that have come from 2014 all the way up to 2020, and we're looking at now a changing shift about how we need to treat patients with obesity. We have, of course, scaled down our cutoff points for the Indian population. So our BMI cutoff now is 25 versus 27, which was for the Western population. And we now take a waist circumference of 10 centimeters more than the upper limit of gender-specific normal for adult Asian uh, Indians. All right. Uh, can I just take one minute more of time, if it's OK? All right. Right. So this is the algorithm, and I don't think it's really too much of uh, to understand out here as to where each of these agents tend to work. Right. So you have patients with BMI more than 30, or versus 27 with comorbidity, and you look at what are the comorbidities. So if the patient has diabetes, pre-diabetes, hypertension, OSAs, or uh, PCOS, liraglutide may be the first choice, and this is based on the level of evidence, followed by an altroxone, bupropion, and then orally stat. And you can, of course, if one treatment fails, you can always switch to the other treatment. And when it comes to more of a mental factors in terms of craving, depression, or smoking, then perhaps naltrexone, bupropion may be the first choice, followed by liraglutide and orlistat. And then, of course, you need to sort of add on to all the other measures of weight management. Uh, these are the different obesity guidelines in terms of summary. So overweight and obesity are generally defined as patients with BMI of more than or equal to 25 and 30 respectively. With complications, frequently they are used to determine obesity severity. Most expert panel consensus guidelines recommend that following treatment with patients with overweight and obesity, lifestyle management is the way to go. And then of course, there is a growing role of pharmacotherapy and then select patients with morbid obesity, with multiple comorbidities, then bariatric surgery may be the way to go. And all obesity patients should be used in, treatment should be used in combination with diet and exercise. For want of time, I just want to sort of take you to one slide, which I think is very important. 
that is the Edmonton obesity staging system. And now we have a proper staging system where we look at stage zero, we look at medical, mental, and functional factors, and we stage them from zero, one, two, three, and four. And this is how we look at it. So stage zero is no sign of obesity related risk factors, no physical symptoms, no psychological symptoms, and no functional limitations. And stage one is, of course, patients with obesity related subclinical risk factors or mild physical symptoms, or there may be mild obesity related psychological symptoms or mild impairment of well being. And then stage two is, of course, established obesity related comorbidities. Moderate is obesity with psychological symptoms and moderate functional limitations. And stage three is, of course, with all these graded upwards. And stage four is, of course, the severity is in terms of end organ failures. So I'll stop here. And uh, I mean, we'll be happy to take any questions further. So I think, yeah, I think that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much.